from fingerprints to genetic prints, it changed how we catch the crooks. From two packs a day to one Band-Aid on the arm, it curbed a major craving. And from space race hostilities to gravity-free global harmony, a space station created new world peace on high. They're all inventions of the 1980s, a decade defined by high tech in the office, in the lab, and just about everywhere. From DNA fingerprinting to the Mir space station to the internet, they're all inventions that shook the world. A new kind of fingerprint, one that can't be wiped away. It's the high-tech way to catch a crook. And none of it would have happened without a sharp-eyed British scientist at the University of Leicester. One morning in 1983, geneticist Alec Jeffries is horrified by the headlines. A teenager has been brutally raped and murdered in a nearby village. A terrible tragedy but there's nothing Jeffries can do about it, or so he thinks. He's using his sharp mind to solve the mysteries of disease, not murder. Jeffries was the kind of guy who did not let anything go unobserved. And that is the mark of somebody who is really paying attention. Somebody's gonna push back some boundaries that um, you haven't even thought of yet. Jeffries must have been born with science in his genes. He had his first microscope at the age of eight. By 22, he graduated from Oxford with a first-class honors degree in biochemistry. Now, in the mid-80s, he's found his life's work in DNA research, the chemical coding system that makes us who we are. It's still a new field, but Jeffries and his colleagues do know a few things. One, we share almost all of our DNA with chimpanzees. Two, only a small part of our DNA makes us human. And three, it's just a tiny fraction of our DNA that makes us physically different from one another. But Jeffries is sure that DNA holds even more secrets, that if he can unlock them, it could help diagnose and cure disease. At the moment, He's studying a single gene, just one tiny piece of the long, twisted DNA strands that make up the human genome. As he looks closely at the X-ray film of the gene, he notices something odd. In the gene, he found a small region in one of the spots that didn't code for any protein. In other words, bits of DNA that appear to have no function but they do have interesting repeat patterns that he's never seen before. Jeffries realizes this could be important. He's determined to find out more. He's a very alert guy. So he says, gee, you know, I wonder what's, I wonder where this came from. Is there, are there other sequences in the genome that could match this? That's the next big question for Jeffries. Will he find the same strange repeat patterns in other genes? He draws blood from a lab associate and her parents to compare their DNA. At first, the results just look like a smeary mess. Time for a closer view. Come take a look at this. He's still not certain what to make of the results. What do you see? I'm not sure yet. But gradually, he starts to see distinct patterns in the DNA of mother, father, and daughter. Then, suddenly, it hits him. He's made an astonishing discovery. The repeat patterns in one person's DNA are distinctly different from those in anyone else's, as unique as a fingerprint. 
he did use this word of DNA fingerprint, and it is appropriate because just like a literal fingerprint, um, these are unique to any individual. So he realized that this has legal and forensic potential. Jeffrey's discovery means there's now a new way to link suspects to a crime. And he'll soon have a chance to prove that the new science works. It's now three years since that first rape and murder. And suddenly, the body of a second teenager is found nearby. A young man is charged with a second rape and murder after he confesses. But he won't admit to the first. By now, Jeffrey's DNA fingerprint discovery is well known. So Jeffries is approached by the police, and they say, listen, we have someone who's confessed to the second murder, and we have his blood, and we know he's done the second murder, so all we want to do is find out if we can also indict him for the first murder. Jeffries compares the suspect's blood with the semen from both crimes, and the results are a shock to everyone. And he comes back to the guys, and he says, well, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is it's the same murderer in both cases. The semen DNA profiles are identical. But the bad news is the guy who's confessed to this murder is not the murderer. Now the police are even more determined. News reporters are on hand as all the local men are brought in for blood tests. And they make a decision to go about collecting blood from every man in the community to see if they can ferret out the person who's actually committed these crimes. The police hand the samples over to Jeffries. He tries to match the DNA results with the semen from the crime scenes, and he fails. But it isn't his science that has let him down. Turns out the real killer had found a way to rig the DNA tests. The man who committed the crime actually convinced a friend to give a blood sample for him because he didn't want to be discovered. Months went by and the guy who had given the blood sample for his friend was talking to somebody else at, the, at a pub and said, oh, I gave this blood sample for this other fellow, you know? And that person ultimately reported it and they, you know, arrested the man who was the the criminal and tested him and indeed it was a match. DNA matching has put many criminals behind bars, but it has also freed hundreds of innocent people. A handful of these have been on death row, so their lives have been saved. Even Queen Elizabeth II recognized the value of Alec Jeffrey's service to science. In 1994, he was knighted. But despite all the fame, the father of DNA evidence is still working, happiest when he's hands-on in the lab, searching for the vital clues that someone else might miss. Other inventions of the decade. 1981, the stealth aircraft. The US Air Force introduces a new combat plane that's invisible, to enemy radar at least. Also that year, the first portable computer, the Osborne, weighing in at 25 pounds with a five inch screen. Just slap on the patch and get that good feeling. A new way to get your nicotine fix without killing yourself. All thanks to a college prof who thought outside the pack. It's the early 1980s in New Mexico. Psychologist Frank Etzcorn, normally a patient man, is about to blow a fuse. He's trying to get his wife, Sherry, to give up her two-pack-a-day habit without much luck. Sherry is addicted to one of the most powerful drugs on the planet, nicotine, and she is hooked. And the woman even told me one night, I was getting a lecture for class, that she was going out to walk the dog. And sort of absent-mindedly, I said, yeah, go right ahead, hon. And then about 10 minutes later, I realized we'd never ever owned a dog. And she was going outside and smoking. My wife started smoking when she was about 13. 
Uh, and that's very typical for Kentuckians. Uh, she had tried to quit. She was much like Mark Twain. She quit hundreds of times. She found it very easy. And um, she worked at it for a number of years. Smoking is dangerous because the nicotine in tobacco addicts you to a whole bunch of other toxic stuff. The things that go along with smoking a cigarette, such as the tar and the carbon monoxide, those are, those are the things that are really bad. The, uh, the tar, that's the, 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 the greasy brown stuff on the end of a filter, that's probably what causes the cancer. And the carbon monoxide blocks the heart's ability to gather oxygen. Frank hates nicotine for its hold on his wife. So yes, I was concerned with her health. Uh, her family had some cardiac problems, and I didn't think smoking was, was the best thing for her. Hey, you really need to do that? <sighs> Frank, leave me alone. Frank may hate nicotine, but he has found it useful. He's experimenting with liquid nicotine to see if it can turn rats off other bad habits like sugar. In other words, aversion therapy. This lab rat drank some sugary water a while ago. Now Etzcorn will try to turn the rat against the sweet snack for life by dosing it with nicotine, which will make it feel very, very sick. Rats uh, cannot vomit uh, under normal circumstances. They don't have the sphincter control of the stomach. And uh, so therefore, they evolved this mechanism to avoid poisons. Uh, that's why they take small bits of novel food that makes them the least bit ill. They avoid it uh, for the rest of their lives. But on this fateful night, Frank is about to have an accident that will take his research in an unexpected new direction. He's just given his own skin a mega dose of nicotine. Now he does something that makes the situation even worse. Sort of wiped it, which actually increased the absorbing surface. Uh, heart rate went up to about 180, and I got really, really sick. Frank is in agony, but his brain starts making some vital connections. Could nicotine dosing through the skin satisfy a smoker's addiction? Would it be enough to make them stop craving the nicotine they inhale through cigarettes? As I was on that floor, uh, some things came together. I had known about the scopolamine patch that's put behind the ear for motion sickness. And uh, I knew that the, uh, there were a lot of problems with people trying to quit. Next step, find a test subject for his idea. Rats don't smoke, but his wife and his brother John sure do. Guys, I need a guinea pig. Absolutely not. Honey, come no. on. Help me out, bro. Is it safe? Hey, give me your arm. Just tell me how that feels. Feels good. Like maybe you just had a cigarette? Yeah. Frank devotes himself to creating the first nicotine patch in the world. The idea is, heavy smokers start with 21 milligrams and wean themselves off the drug gradually. So when the person feels right, they, they go down to a, a 14 milligram patch and then the same process down to seven, and then hopefully you quit. His timing couldn't be better. By the 1980s, the evidence that smoking kills is overwhelming so the habit is becoming socially unacceptable. But that doesn't persuade Frank's college to cough up the dough for the process of getting a patent. Until he quotes one of his favorite texts to the college president. It said something to the effect that someday, someone is gonna figure out how to get nicotine into the human's body without them smoking it, dipping it, or chewing it, and they're gonna make a lot of money. And I gave that to the president and I was funded that afternoon. Frank's patch is patented in 1986. Drug companies buy the technology and put the patch on the market. Frank's world explodes. It was like a bomb going off. I just couldn't believe any of this stuff. Uh, there's a little old psychologist in the middle of New Mexico, and suddenly all this is hit. And uh, it was a dream come true. I, it was the lottery. Even better than the lottery, Sherry is finally able to kick her 30-year habit thanks to her husband's invention. 
My wife quit smoking, and I am so proud of her for doing that. Uh, the patch worked for, but I think the biggest motivator for my wife was having a, a brand new granddaughter, and she didn't want to see her smoking. An average of 15 million patch prescriptions are sold each year to smokers who want to kick the habit. They don't all succeed, but there's no question. Frank Etzkorn's invention has helped a lot of people live longer and healthier. Other inventions of the decade. In 1986, superconducting ceramics arrive. Super cool, they carry electricity without heating up. I have not known scientific development as exciting since the development of the laser. In 1988, the intravascular stent. Invented by an Argentinian surgeon, it's a lifesaver to millions of cardiac patients. Info in an instant. Just click the send button and presto, you're connected with anyone on the planet. Global networking makes the rest of the world accessible to all of us. Thanks to a couple of curious computer nerds. October 1972. Day one of Bob Kahn's brand new job at the Pentagon in Washington. Good morning, Dapa. Just one second, I'll transfer you. He has no idea that he's about to change the whole world of communication, but he is just the kind of guy who could. He uh, was and is a very, just brilliant, brilliant man. And in the computer science world, he was always interested in, in taking everything to the next level of, okay, what happens then in terms of data communications? Bob has joined DARPA. The D is for defense, and ARPA is Advanced Research Projects Agency. They're not developing new weapons in here, but they are fighting a long-term battle. It's the Cold War. The Americans are determined to beat Russia in the space race and to stay well ahead in every field of science. Now, in the early 1970s, computer networking is the latest hot technology. For newbie Bob Kahn, working for the ARPA team is a dream come true. Being at ARPA was like being at a university, actually, so that you could engage in uh, basic research without having to teach classes or fight for tenure. You'd think that everything that came out of ARPA would be, you know, all defense-related and military and, and um, you know, sort of Star Wars-like stuff. but. Actually, it wasn't, which was, a, which was very nice for the scientists who went to work at ARPA because they knew that um, a lot of them would be given free reign to pursue what they wanted to pursue. Best of all, Bob gets to play on the ARPANET, the first network of computers in the world. It's a primitive forerunner to the Internet. In 1972, there are fewer than 30 members sending packets of information back and forth. And they're all huge organizations. It really was the first functioning network of computers all linked together and communicating with each other all over the country. Very few can afford the astronomical membership fees. In order to get a connection to the ARPANET, you had to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it was sort of an exclusive place to be. But soon, everyone wants to send and receive information by computer. Small independent networks spring up around the world. That gives Bob Kahn a very big idea. What if he could find a way to link all those independent networks to each other? He knows just who to call in to help him make it happen computer scientist Vince Cerf from California. Hey, uh, guys, I have a special guest here for you. Uh, this is Vince Cerf. <laughs> How you doing, guys? It's, uh, Bob and Vint are convinced there's a way to get the whole world connected so computers all around the planet can talk to one another. So where do we start? It won't be easy they have a huge problem to solve first. 
Each network is like a country that has its own language. The computers inside the network can talk to one another, but can't talk to the computers in any other network. Bob and Vint hunker down at a hotel for a weekend of brainstorming. Let's go there. What do you think? They already have a language that's used by ARPANET computers to transmit information, called a protocol. We add this to look at that. That is oh, that's crazy. But it was only designed to work inside a network. They have to come up with a new protocol to act as a bridge between networks. Like that? And then, what do you think? One that can network all the networks around the world. They work all day and throughout each night. By the end of the weekend, success. They've invented a new international computer language. It's called Transmission Control Protocol. It was this idea of taking these disparate networks and figuring it out a way to put the data in an envelope and take it back out of the envelope. And that's, it really seems like a very simple idea, but there's a lot of computer work going on behind the scenes. The inventors decide to take their new discovery on the road, in part to impress the military brass who are funding them. This technology, they're pointing out, could be used on army maneuvers. So they got a van, basically a bread truck, and they outfitted it with all this equipment and they drove it around and they had data traveling between networks all over the world. They transmit information between three different kinds of networks, the ARPANET, a radio network, and a satellite network. The biggest question is, can all the data go round the world through the three networks and come back intact? Turns out the experiment is a huge success. I think that the data traveled like 100,000 miles without dropping a single bit. And that was the big uh, triumph. They had proved it. Their protocol, TCP, can create a new worldwide inter-network. All right, Steve, I need you to listen to me. But now they have to convince all the stubborn ARPANET members to use it. We're making the switch January 1st, 1983. They had to give people plenty of warning because they were saying to people that if you want to stay on the internet, you need to make this switch from NCP to TCP by 12.01 a.m. January 1st, 1983, or you're off the network. Finally, after fair warning and temporary shutdowns, the old ARPANET protocol is turned off permanently on January 1st, 1983. Bob Kahn and his team wait anxiously. Now that TCP is the only game in town, have they managed to persuade the ARPANET members to switch over? Yes, they have. TCP makes it possible for every computer in the world to have a unique address. Networking is no longer an exclusive club. Universities can internet. Soon, everyone on the planet can internet, creating a giant World Wide Web. And the thing to remember about the evolution of this, of this network is that it was, it was really just an experiment. These guys were pure researchers. They were geeks. It was, let's see if we can just get these machines to talk to each other. This team has left quite a legacy. Three billion people are active on the internet today. Bob and Vin's internet protocol is still the link that allows all of us to communicate with one another around the globe in the blink of an eye. Other inventions of the decade. 1981, the scanning tunneling microscope, a device so precise it can actually split molecules into atoms. 1982, the Vectrex, the first video game that comes with its own monitor. 
before any kid could afford a home computer. 1983, the new bagless vacuum cleaner from Britain. Yes, after a performance like that, I think you better go. Imagine swallowing a pill-sized camera that takes a movie of your whole digestive tract instead of the medical test everyone dreads. Mom, I'm home. The first giant leap to make that a reality is thanks to one teenager who dreamed big. It's 1985 in Corning, New York. In many ways, Tarun Malik seems like a typical teenager. Mom, stop. But he's not. He's actually a science whiz with straight A's and a passion for medicine. My interest in medicine began when I was uh, younger and was trying to figure out, as a teenager, trying to figure out what I wanted to do in life. The science, the research, uh, the taking care of patients. When Tarun is 13, he gets a chance to hang out with the local gastroenterologist, a doctor who checks out the whole digestive system for signs of trouble. Tarun is only a kid, but today he's getting a close look at a procedure that makes most adults squirm, a colonoscopy. There were some things that entered my mind. This is a very amazing technology where you can actually look inside the colon to look for polyps, which may be precursors to cancer, to find them and remove them. Tarun is intrigued, but he understands the patient's nervousness. Who, after all, would want to have a tube put in their bottom if they didn't have to? Uh, so, uh, it's a very uh, challenging test. The endoscope is a fiber optic tube. It acts like a video camera showing a journey through the large intestine on a monitor. The doctor watches out for anything that doesn't look right, like signs of cancer. Colonoscopies save lives. But Tarun figures there's got to be an easier way. Most kids would leave it at that, but not Tarun. That day at the doctor's office sends his mind spinning into the world of high-tech spy gadgets. I'd seen every James Bond movie about six times as a child. And so that part of it intrigued me, the ability to devise cool gadgets that ultimately could make life simpler. Could 007 help him come up with a solution? Daydreaming in class at his high school one day, the full idea suddenly hits Tarun like a ton of bricks. Out of the blue, I was probably bored in physics class is what I think what happened. Not that physics is boring, uh, don't get me wrong, but uh, I kind of got it. He imagines himself back in the doctor's office where the patient is given a pill to swallow a pill with a camera inside it. Then the camera inside the capsule does all the work, taking pictures of the digestive tract as it moves through the body. You swallow the capsule, go to work, go to the gym, take a shower, do whatever, whatever you want. It's recording images all during that period of time. Inside the body, the camera transmits signals to a wireless video recorder the patient wears on a belt. At the end of the journey, the pill gets flushed, but all the data is safe and sound in the recorder. You bring that device back after a couple of days, and there you have all the information that you actually needed, presto. In the family basement, Tarun goes to work, gathering the bits and pieces he'll need to build his first prototype out of a plastic tennis ball container. Soon, he's got the camera part down pat, but he's a long way from anything that could be swallowed. Next step, scale down the capsule size with a little help from his parents. I was a teenager, so I didn't make any money myself, so they gave me the money to uh, buy things and put things together. Before long, Tarun is testing a smaller capsule in a much smaller tube. After plenty of work on his own, he gets some crucial help from a family friend. Hey, thanks for coming. 
engineer, Ram Nair. Here's the recorder I talked about. The capsule can now be operated wirelessly, and it's just the right size to swallow. It's uh, for the patent. <laughs> it's a long 20-year process, but finally, Tarun gets his patent. Meanwhile, he goes on to graduate from Johns Hopkins University with degrees in medicine and biophysics. And he fulfills his dream of becoming a doctor himself. Today, the capsule is being used by doctors around the world to show images of the small intestine, the middle area of the digestive system. Scopes can't reach this part from either end. At the front end of the capsule is the lens. In the middle, a battery that powers the camera. And pulling out the rear is a miniature video transmitter that sends the images to a data recorder worn by the patient. Capsule endoscopy hasn't yet replaced the traditional colonoscopy. That's because the capsule only gives a quick glimpse of the digestive tract, with no chance to go back and take a second look. Tarun and others are working on ways to navigate the capsule and equip it with tools to do jobs like snipping polyps. We have already developed capsules that can actually do therapeutic interventions on uh, the GI tract right then and there, such as removing polyps, treating bleeding lesions. It's big thinkers like Tarun and big ideas like his that continue to change the whole world of medical research. Other inventions of the decade. 1984, the Macintosh, the first affordable computer to use icons, windows, and a mouse. That same year, the Skycam gives TV sports fans a bird's eye view. And in 1989, the InCan widget is unveiled. A small plastic capsule inside a can produces a creamier head much to the delight of beer drinkers around the world. That's obviously the perfect way to get a good, thick head. For the first time ever, on a giant new outpost in space, orbiting the Earth, it's all cooperation and harmony. Gone is the wasteful competition of the space race. Thanks to a far-sighted Soviet space engineer, it's early morning, July 20th, 1969. In Moscow, everyone's watching Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. That's one small step for man. It's a giant leap for the Americans in the space race. But everyone in the Soviet Union has just gone into mourning, especially at the space agency Energia. As a whole, the country was enormously depressed because they were expecting to win. It was a national funk that they're in for some time. But there's one lone contrarian who's actually relieved that the Americans got to the moon first. Konstantin Fyoktistov, chief space engineer. The moon was for him a detour, a blind alley, one that he was just as happy that was out of the way now, and he can now do important stuff. Theoktistov has a much bigger dream of flying to Mars at least 150 times farther. His own desires was to bypass the moon, to go farther in space, letting people spend years in space and travel hundreds of millions of miles, not just around the block. Theoktistov has already done his bit to keep Russia ahead in the space race. He helped design the spacecraft that launched Yuri Gagarin in 1961. He was the first man ever to visit outer space. In the 1970s, Fyoktistov leads the design of the world's first series of space stations, nine of them called Salyuts. They're launched just once and stay up in space, orbiting the Earth. Smaller spacecraft fly up and dock at the rear of the station to deliver visiting cosmonauts. 
They live on board and do research in this unique gravity-free environment. They could send crews up to them for weeks or even months. So they, they were beginning to pioneer longer and longer flights. But the Salyuts are just 20 meter cylinders and they don't last long, six months to a year at most. Fyokhtistov would need something far more substantial to use as a base for traveling to Mars. Fyokhtistov knew that you can't go directly from Earth to Mars. You'd have to build space stations and use those as staging areas to assemble a ship, refuel it, test it out, and then depart. You wanted to build way stations on the way somewhere else. All of a sudden, in 1976, the political stars align in Fyokhtistov's favor the Soviets want a more permanent space station for long-term research, four times the size of a Salyut with multiple docking ports. For this monster project, Fyokhtistov will need his best engineers. Too bad he does nothing but alienate them. Fyokhtistov was a very intelligent man who was aware of his level of his intelligence, and uh, often people like that rub people the wrong way. So he was not a good company man, but he was a good person to be in charge of projects. Fyokhtistov soon has plenty of design ideas, but the challenge is how to build this much larger station. It sure can't be constructed on the ground and then launched into space. First, we don't have rockets that big. And secondly, <laughs> Building a station on the ground is a very complex operation. You don't finish it all at once. You finish it piecemeal. Suddenly, in a moment one day, the solution comes to him. The space station could be modular, built in separate pieces on the ground and assembled up in space. Fyokhtistov goes to put his ideas down on paper. He plans a station with a core module, powered by solar panels. There would be docking ports at each end for smaller research modules or visiting spaceships. But adding the modules to the core end-to-end, -end, like a long freight train, creates a whole set of problems. Space station modules can only be latched together, much like rail cars on a train. No bolts, no welding. So a long string of them would have too much flexibility. On a structure that's, that's large, really large in space, 100 meters long, for example, there is a series of different forces. There is slight aerodynamic forces that try and turn it and twist it. The gravitational forces across this length are different, and it'll actually try to torque it and twist it. Time to go back to the drawing board. Fyokhtistov's design number two solves the twisting problem. They won't dock the modules end to end. They'll dock them on the side of the station. But this idea creates yet another problem. Docking a module at a 90-degree angle to the core is a recipe for disaster. Imagine hitting any kind of structure from the side. You're putting a force, a bending force, into that large structure. If they hit this from the side with too big of a spacecraft, too big a force, you could damage the long section. Fyokhtistov's final solution is revolutionary. A crane-like robotic arm attached to each module will swing the module around and install it gently on the side of the core module. If it works, there will be far less risk of damage to the core. They solved it by saying, we don't have to dock in the side. We can dock at the back end. And then we can use a mechanical arm, a swivel, to take that module and move it off to the side. It was a brilliant, simple solution to what looked like a complicated problem. It's brilliant, all right. But it will be one of the riskiest maneuvers ever attempted in outer space. It's February, 1987, 350 kilometers above Earth. The core module of the new Soviet space station is now in orbit. And the station has a name, Mir, which has two meanings, world and peace. 
Now comes the big test for chief designer Konstantin Fyokdistov. The first attempt to use the crane arm he and his team have invented, what they're calling the robot paw. The idea is that the next module will dock at the rear of the core section. The robot paw attached to it will reach back, lift the module off, turn it 90 degrees, and redock it on the side of the core. It's brilliant, if it works. For Fyokdistov, the stakes are mighty high. When you're building engineering systems like this novel space paw to move modules back and forth, uh, your reputation's on the line with that. And so if it didn't work, it might be the end of a career. Everyone at the Soviet Space Agency holds their breath as the first robot paw operation begins. The module docks at the rear of the core in its temporary position. The robot paw reaches around to grab the module. And draws it into one of the docking ports. And now, the moment of truth. The project can't afford a disastrous collision at this point. But no fear, the docking goes like clockwork. Fyokdistov, the contrarian, proves himself dead right once again. And the relieved crew members get to celebrate. Designed to last only five years, Mir remains up in space for an amazing 15 years, hosting visiting aerospace scientists from around the world. In 1995, Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield flies up to Mir in a U.S. space shuttle. It felt like I was a tapeworm going through an intestine, pulling myself through this dark place where I'm squeezing through all these flexible tubes, trying to get into the next particular volume of Mir. So it was dark and very constrained, but at the same time wondrous. One of the main purposes in going to Mir, from a decisional capability of the United States, of, the, of NASA, was to learn how to build space stations and how to go to space stations. Also to build links with the Soviet Union, or Russia at that time. The camaraderie on board amazes him. Here we are, people from different continents, different backgrounds, uh, different cultures, who have come just very recently out of a pretty hostile time in human history, and now being on board this multinational, first great human outpost in space, Konstantin Fyokdistov's Mir is finally decommissioned in 2001. It goes down grandly in a ball of flames over the Pacific. Fyokdistov dies in 2009 at the age of 83, leaving future space travelers with the challenge of getting to Mars. Mars is uh, a long ways away. Uh, we will get there. It's just a matter of when. Fyokdistov's ingenious design lives on in its own successor, the International Space Station. Fourteen nations working together in a true spirit of collaboration that all began with Mir. And so end the techno 1980s in what was the most innovative century the world has ever known. <laughs>